Namaste and welcome everyone. I'm here with my close friend, colleague, and teacher, Dr. Dharmesh Mehta of DM Astrology. And we have be, uh, gone in depth in our series of uh, each planet in all 12 signs, in all 12 houses. And uh, we did Sun, Moon, Saturn. And now because of the Saturn K2 conjunction that's so profound, we want to focus on K2. So we're going to be taking K2 through the 12 houses and 12 signs today. Um, it's such an honor and pleasure to be with you again here, Dr. Dharmesh. Namaste, sir. Namaste, Janati. It is a pleasure for me also. Because while you discuss with someone, that time you also realize that uh, what are the corners you have not touched, which other has touched. So it makes you complete. Sometimes it happens that uh, you might have seen the one part of uh, aspect of a planet and you have not touched the other aspect. When you discuss each other, then that will be, you'll be realizing that this also being a part. So that I also uh, uh, grateful that uh, we discuss. And uh, I believe 99% of our uh, things match. So yes. there is hardly any difference. <laughs> so that's alignment. Uh, we have very good... Uh, and that will continue and that will be benefit for viewers also. Yes. So, um, we should mention our Dasha Summit as well um, on the August 18th. Um, yeah, should, yeah, I yeah. Dis should I discuss or should you mention, sir? Sure. Sure. You mentioned. On August 18th, Dr. Dharmesh and I, along with our friend Sunili Jani Power, Sam Sadasi Vajapi, and Narasimha Rao, PVR, will be joining us for the uh, Dasha Summit. Uh, this is a free event for anyone who wants to attend. Just go to Shenati Jyotish Facebook. You'll find the Zoom link for the registration. And uh, this event is free. So we all get to learn from each other. The teachers get to learn from each other. The students get to learn from many teachers. And so it's a real benefit yeah. for all of us. And we also clear up a lot of misconceptions that come up in the science of Jyotish. So we hope you'll yeah. join us for the Dasha Summit. And I know you're looking forward to it as well, Dr. Dharmesh. Yeah, that is a, uh, that's a, a very uh, different aspect of a Vedic astrology that they have also mentioned the events of our time, which was missing in the Western astrology and other format of astrology. Whereas in the Vedic, all the sages has given the time frame. And that time frame we divide into the Dasha and Gochar, means the Dasha and Transit. We are going to discuss the Dasha and uh, that is a core part of a prediction. If uh, Suppose I can't think astrology without the Dasha. So that will be a great uh, discussion going to happen. Viewers, please register today only. It will be very late. And I believe we have restricted some numbers. So immediately... Uh, viewers should uh, register themselves to get uh, such a valuable knowledge with uh, so many uh, great aspects of astrology. So uh, I also request uh, viewers that uh, please register now itself uh, by going the link uh, Chanati has already provided. And we will mention that same link in our uh, this present video also. So you may also directly click there and you can uh, join from there also. So we'll uh, provide the link in this video also. And it will so, be, uh, be great to have you, the master of Dasha, there, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there are a lot of people. I also learn so many things. So yes, let us start, yes, Ketu. Okay, great. Um, would you would you like to start with Ketu in the first house, or shall I? No, uh, let us uh, first uh, give the aspect of the Ketu because that is, uh, I believe, out of a nine planet. Uh, people don't uh, consider Ketu as a planet. They say that is a shadow planet or this is just a shadow. But let me think, even though it is not in mass, the Ketu and Rahu both are not in mass, but still their impact is such that now in technology time, we believe that there is something called a uh, network. So that network was discovered by the uh, great sages in the name of a Rahu and Ketu, but they could not able to describe that, how that network works. And I know that's the same network which continues persons 
from past life to present life to next life is nothing but the rahu and ketu so that is a, a network which uh, our sages has not able to describe so they have just mentioned a shadow and that rahu and ketu we are going to discuss today especially a ketu part will discuss the rahu later part because most of a misconception is about the ketu i have seen so many astrologers not being considering ketu as a planet they are not they are ignoring the ketu part i know that uh, it is not much written about the ketu but uh, that is a beautiful planet by which person can transform many people wish or i believe that uh, everyone wish to have a spirituality everybody want to uh, this moksha but they are ignoring ketu without the ketu i believe that there is no way to release your soul from this life and uh, that is the best part of a ketu that it has it is placed in your chart but it's so silent it's writing all your deeds see we always do many deeds by our uh, wording by our thoughts by our uh, actual karmas we many times don't realize that we have think something bad about others but that is recorded by this ketu and uh, we all believe in hindu mythology there is a chitragupta who write everybody's deed it is not a person chitragupta is nothing but the ketu placement in your chart and is registering everything the first video i have started with the, uh, my friend uh, sunil in saptarishi was also a ketu where i say that the ketu is a receptive energy and rahu is reflective energy it is receptive it receive everything but it can't reflect it write down every each and every deeds if in the 24 hours in 1440 second whatever the thoughts you have see even though we sleep we uh, get a dreams we get a nightmare there also we are putting some deeds and that all the deeds has been registered in the ketu if you are getting a ketu dasha in your life then you are lucky that you get a chance to release all your past deeds so that much a small introduction was of ketu is important don't get scared about the ketu ketu never make the people scared because it's so silent you can only realize its result but you cannot feel you cannot touch the result of a ketu so that is a some basic introduction of a ketu to remove the myth of a ketu from the viewers uh, i appreciate you also add something about the ketu thank you so much dr darmesh that was deeply resonant with me and i couldn't agree more about taking the fear and stigma away out of the fear that is associated with k2 part of what i want to say is that every planet has a direction which it likes to travel north south east west well get guess what the direction of k2 is it's to heaven it's upward it's to svarga So K2 is this force and that's why it is the moksha karaka that's why it is the moksha significator because it is trying to pull us to heaven it is trying to take our soul through the various layers of moksha now the there are difficult associations because on the process of moksha we have to let go and some things are hard to let go of and K2 will make us let go of the things which are hard to let go of and we will discuss that through the 12 houses but there is a strong karmic past life connection which is associated with K2 we have a lot of pending karma in our past lifetimes where we have certain karmic lessons and we have gone through certain karmic patterns and then K2 shows up in our chart in this life time to show us where our past life times are and where our karmic lessons and patterning are um the interesting thing is just because we have that karmic history just because we have that karmic pattern uh doesn't mean the karma is complete and so like dr dharma says if you have k2 dasha or strong k2 dasha you can complete your pending karma but this is the karma which is coming from your past lifetime it it and so um a lot of the times the karma is very powerful it's very profound it's very deep 
So a lot of the um, K2 is also drink the Amritam. As we go back from the story, K2 drink the Amritam. Why? To become the enlightened, to, to become the celestial, to become the ambrosia. Uh, so the K2, it helps us get to moksha, which for most human beings means we cannot be afraid of the death. Because if you are afraid of the death, then you can never truly experience the moksha. Then there's the next layer of moksha, which is letting go of all of our attachments, letting go of all of our worldly desires, the renunciation of the material world. That is also part of the moksha. Then there's actually the ultimate moksha, the mahasamadhi, where we can end the cycle of reincarnation. If you're going to use jyotish to help you get closer to moksha, whether it's not being afraid of dead, letting go of attachments, even the Mahasamadhi, you must go through K2 Deva. And that's why K2 is more like a guardian angel than it is more like than a demon of any kind. The only reason that we might experience that as a demon is because K2 gives us obstacles. Why? Because those obstacles are supposed to help us change. They're supposed to help us transform so we can get closer to the moksha, so we can get closer to the potential, so we can get closer to the goal. So sometimes the obstacles, we say, oh, there's this difficult obstacle, let me complain. But actually, when you get through the obstacle, that's when the transformation that it's necessary that is going to happen. So K2 is really like an angel in many different ways, as long as we transform in the way that we are supposed to be transforming spiritually. So that's just what I wanted to mention about K2, and I look forward to discussing uh, hearing Dr. Dharmesh on the first house position of K2. Yeah. See, that is why uh, in K2, they have, in Dasa system also, in Vimshatri Dasa, they have put into the starting point. All the nakshatras, all the constellations start with the K2 only. So they are the lucky people who are having a K2 in the first house, K2 in Aries, K2 Sun together, and K2 Dasha birth. These are the four different categories of a people having something karmic direct connection. What happened? We are only here, we are only discussing the K2 in first house and Aries. The latter part of a Dasha will be joining in the Dasha summit. So, what happens when the K2 in the first house, irrespective of the sign, first we'll discuss the, just the placement of a K2 in the first house. That means the body, what you got in this life, has been prayed for so many years. And that is why you got the body in this life. See, when we are not as a human being, we are into the many different, different uh, yonis we have to pass. While we are transforming our life to the different yonis, we have seen the human beings, like a dog. See, dog can see us. Like so many birds, like so many animals, we, who can see a human being. During that uh, journey of their life, they always pray that once upon a time, God give me a human body so that I can also release all my deeds. Right? So that is the vacuum or that is a prayer which you have done in the past so many lives that I want a human body. And that you get when the Ketu is in the first house. Whenever the Ketu is in the first house, you have a, too much a dryness with the people. Because your soul and your body is not being attached with the surrounding where you are. You are not being connected with the, the many people who are at present with you. So what happens that the soul is not getting connection with the body and body cannot be aligned with the person. So they are somewhat called a dry people. I always say Ketu is a dry planet. It makes a thing dry. Whichever the house the Ketu place, that house becomes dry. You can't realize, you can't see beyond that. See, Ketu is like a cloud. When cloud come in front of the sun, even you can't see the sunlight. The same way when the Ketu place in the first house, that means this body, what you got in this life, and the soul inside the body has a different characteristic. Normally, when Ketu place in the other house and the Ketu placement in the first house, you have some dry period, you have some vacuum period whereby your soul has been resting some time, and then now you got a human being. So they are very dry people. You will sometimes find that why he is antisocial. 
why he is not connecting with the people why he is isolated this is a ketu indication of a ketu in the first house you will not get an attachment see when you go to a new place you are never being a, a, again suppose i am when i am visiting suppose to a usa i don't know the culture i don't know the language i don't know the food pattern i don't know the uh, system of a life in the usa so i will be always being stranger in that place the same way when the k2 place in the first house of someone he is being a stranger in my marriage video also i said whenever the k2 and rahu in the ascendant they should be always guided by others otherwise they will be misguided when we discuss the k2 we should not forget just 180 degree uh, opposite to it the rahu is place rahu always put the instigation rahu is nothing but the instigation it always instigate do this do this do this and ketu silently uh, see and observe everything and when everything been happened by the rahu the Ra ketu is only see in the my ketu video also i said ketu is nothing but your own shadow whenever you walk whenever you see your shadow follows you 24 hours even in the night time also you will feel your shadow is there sometimes you get a background voice in your ear whenever you are alone you are thinking should i do this or should i not do this you get some noise okay do it okay don't do it this is a ketu this is a right thing when you find first answer in your mind is ketu when you ignoring that and when you overlap this and do something which has not been advised that time it is not advised then you are out of a karmic things and you are doing some new deeds you just listen to your voice inner voice or whatever voice so when ketu is in first house they get instinct they get uh, uh, what is bad what what is good and sometimes they become confused because the first house is a body and soul alignment is a first house they are not able to channelize their body and uh, soul and because of the going inclining to either side either the body side or either the soul side they become a confused whenever ketu in first house you will not able to attach with the people because in front of you you will find the rahu people the yes, seventh house we always see is the people whom you face so you will always face the people of a rahu means a very selfish people who like to drag you from uh, from you anything and you are just not realizing that you are being a part of certain things which you should not supposed to do and that is a first house when we start the aries when we look about the aries aries a first sign in aries first nakshatra that is ashwini itself of a ketu the ketu nakshatra or the ashwini nakshatra see ketu all three nakshatras are very crucial point of your body first when you talk about the ashwini it is exactly your brahma chakra it is ashwini from a line of uh, this it is your this portion this uh, brahma chakra in the center to your uh, uh, skull this is a ashwini so this is a ketu part where every secret lies ashwini is nothing but the uh, problem solving or solution where every problem is lies here only your brain is having everything your uh, uh, sastra chakra has everything and when mesh in the aries when the ketu is there they are the people who are a good healer in my one of a video of a healer i said that the ashwini maga and mool are the good healer because they got the instinct from the nature so when the aries the uh, uh, your uh, ketu plays in the aries that means you are a natural healer a kalpurus first sign a ketu itself as a default ashwini nakshatra lord so it is a very good combination you are a good healer whenever you touch anyone they grow the second nakshatra of uh, aries is also a bharni which is very uh, friendly with the ketu ketu and venus so bharni see this our scalp is a bharni nakshatra up to our eyebrow this is a bharni that is why this is our luck many people see the these lines by this uh, they tell the fortune so your forehead is nothing but the bharni bharni means to feel this is our feel right and the kritika is our nose 
So this is also a very sign, a good sign of uh, Ketu in the Aries. And whenever the Ketu is in Aries, that means it's uh, you are the people who are going to do reform. You are going to change something in the life. And uh, being as a fire sign, you are a new beginner. So that is a part of a Ketu being in the first house I describe and Ketu in the Aries. Both have a different idea. One is on the moon sign and one is on the ascendant sign. So one is affecting you physically and one is affecting you mentally. But if you are lucky and you have an Aries ascendant and Ketu in the first house and it is your moon sign also, then you are lucky, luckiest person. So that much I have to add about the Ketu in Aries and Ketu in the first house. Uh, do share your views about the Ketu in the first house and Aries. Thank you, Dr. Dharmesh. Everything you said with, as usual, resonates with me very deeply. I just want to add a few things. Um, one thing that we know about the story of K2 when we think about K2 in the first house is that K2 has no head. K2 is just a tail which has no head, which means it can't see with its visual eyes. So most people who are born with K2 in the first house, it's kind of like walking around without your head on. Now, that has a positive and that has a challenge because when you don't have your physical head, you're supposed to be seeing with your intuition. That little thing, that little sound that Dr. Darmesh mentioned that the K2 in the first house person ascendant, that should be always with the person. That should always be connected to the person. There are many different types of intuition that we can see in Jyotish. There's logical intuition, there's emotional intuition, but K2 is more the psychic type intuition, the, the, the supernatural type of the intuition. So it is this almost like unexpected uh, channeling from, because K2 is channeling from heaven, right? It is going upwards towards heaven. So there can be a channeling of a higher power. And so when K2 is in the first house, you get these channeling abilities. So people very strong with K2 in the first house have the strong ability to be the channel. Now, you have to look at the dignity of the K2, the nakshatra of the K2 and everything to see what type of channel they're going to be. Are they going to be a channel uh, for healing energy? If it's in Ashwini, most likely. If they are going to be, if it's going to be in a very difficult position, maybe they could be into some dark channeling. Maybe they could be into witchcraft. So we have to consider that these temptations are, 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 are also possibilities. Now, one thing that K2 cares about is getting you aligned to your highest potential or frequency at all costs. And even though K2 is uh, Moksha Karika, when it's in the first house, it's in a Dharma house. So yes, it will get you to Moksha, but you have to complete your Dharma first. And so oftentimes people who have strong K2 in the first house, they have this strong Dharma which they must fulfill before they can really begin to associate um, with the moksha, with the spirituality, with their spiritual evolution. And because as mentioned, Rahu's always aspecting it, there's this material aspect, how to perform within society how to perform within the material world. Yes, some people want to go to the, uh, live in the cave in the Himalayas because they have K2 in the first house and other people want to become CEO. They want to become owner of large business because it really, it does indicate wanting to achieve your full potential at all costs. And see, um, K2 will throughout your life show you many signs or suggestions. That's why I like to call K2 in the first house is the giver of omens. So if K2 is in good position in the first house, this person can see the omen, they can interpret the omen, and, uh, and they don't go crazy, which means, oh, here is a sign, here is a message from the universe. But if K2 is in a difficult position, let's say the moon is afflicted somewhere else in the chart, or the mercury is afflicted somewhere else very strongly in the chart, Maybe they even have mild schizophrenia. They, they, they think everything is a sign. This is a sign. That's a sign. That little speck of sand is a sign. That uh, food on the spoon is a sign. They will over-interpret everything as being a sign. So 
when K2 is in the when when in its most positive position, we are actually seeing the heavenly omens which the devas are sending us from not from Svarga, from that from the celestial dimension. But if K2 is very ungrounded, unbalanced, afflicted, afflicted moon, and sometimes we can overinterpret these omens. But a lot of time, there is a lot of karmic weight carrying into the dharma of the first house K2 person. What is their responsibility? Um, maybe that they might have born, been born poor, but they have to raise a family. So they have to get a job and they, they end up becoming very successful in their job. I've seen um, K2 ascendant people, they become great gurus, they become great teachers, they become great renunciates. And that's when they choose the more spiritual path associated with the K2. Maybe that's part of their dharma. But I've also seen people have very strong material dharmas to fulfill or roles within society to fulfill with K2 in the first house. Maybe they will be judge. Maybe they will be lawyer. Maybe uh, they will be CEO. Maybe they will be government official because it really has this strong karmic uh, calling. Yes. Um, as Dr. As, uh, Dr. Dharma said, it's the desire to want to become a human body so you can fulfill your karmas. So what are some of those karmas? Well, maybe you want to be this. Well, maybe you want to be that. This will show up with K2 in the first house. But I think the most interesting thing about it is that the person is blind because K2 has no head. So a lot of times all of the um, success, and change, and growth, and even their process towards moksha, even their process towards enlightenment, they might not necessarily be consciously aware of it. Yes, it's happening. Yes, it's going on. Yes, they're getting to their higher position, or maybe they're getting close to moksha, but they might not be consciously aware with, of it, or even know what moksha is, unless you were willing to have a conversation with them about it. So it's a very powerful karmic position for K2 in the seventh, uh, K2 in the first house. But because Rahu aspects the seventh house, sometimes this is shows a very pure person be, being attracted to temptation, being attracted to the darker uh, energies, uh, such as uh, a very pure man being attracted to a, to a, um, a, a girl who um, is troubled or a, uh, a very pure girl who's being attracted to a, a troubled guy. So there is this uh, d uh, dichotomy which plays up here between Rahu and Ketu in the first house, seventh house. And so a good compatibility aspect if you have Ketu in the first house is um, that the person that you're attracted to, they're into spirituality, they're into mysticism, they're into the occult, the better side of Rahu, not the darker side of Rahu. Um, that's, that's just some of what I'd like to say about having K2 in the first house. But the first house is the, uh, also the personality of the person. Um, and because K2 is uh, very transformative, the personality and the body type, how the body looks of the person, will be transforming a lot throughout their life. So one time they're a skinny person, five years later they're a fat person. Five years later they're a skinny person again, ten years later they're a fat person. Depending on the dasha, their body will always be changing. They might, their face might start to look different as they age. And this was very interesting um, as we talk about the different positions associated with the body and the different nakshatras and the different signs. Um, it might show where the age might come in. but there is this process, uh, which is also worth mentioning, is that the body changes throughout the lifetime and the personality can become more severe uh, throughout the lifetime as well. So those are two notable things about uh, K2 in the first house I wanted to add. Now, when we discuss K2 in Aries, um, it's, it's a good position um, because K2 has a friendly relationship with Aries rulers, Mangala, Mars. So we're looking at K2 Mars having a beneficial relationship with each other. However, K2 fire, Mars is fire. So you're getting a lot of fire here. You're getting a lot of double pitta energies. So if K2 is in Aries in the sixth house, eighth house, 
This could even indicate certain health challenges. So you have to um, consider all the pitta that's being involved here when the K2 is in Aries, but it's a very strong position. As mentioned in Ashwini, there's a lot of healing potential. In Barani, very attractive person. People are very attracted to them. They can have lots of creative ability. Uh, and in Kritika Nakshatra, that's really when they have strong karmic ancestral shoes to fill. Lots of karma that they must step into and fulfill. Um, but, but, but generally, K2 and Aries people, they are very determined. They are very ambitious. They are very hardworking. They keep going and going and going and going. And one of the things about interesting about K2 and Aries is the Aries energy is progressive. It's very advancing. Part of, the, part of the uncomfortable energy of the K2 in Aries is K2 is very transforming. So someone might be, let's say you have K2 Aries in 10th house. Let's say you have K2 in Aries in the 10th house of your career. You're progressing, you're advancing, you're growing in your life, you're growing in your career. All of a sudden you get fired. All of a sudden you get transferred to a new land for your, your promotion. All of a sudden, your job responsibilities begins to change. So um, part of, it is a very good position for reaching the full potential, a lot of success, lots of healing capabilities, lots of, uh, of um, kind of, okay, this is my pending karma, what may I do to fulfill it? What may I, how can I grow to fulfill it? How can I, what's the next, what is my goal that I can set to get closer to fulfill my potential and how can I reach that goal? It's a very good position for the K2 uh, Aries position. But part of the challenge of the K2 Aries position is all of that Pitta energy. So these people can be ir easily frustrated. These people can be easily irritated. These people can have issues with their skin and with their liver Ranjika Pitta, they can also have uh, issues um, where they can uh, be violent. Um, they could be aggressive. So they always have to know to keep their Pitta in balance, keep their Pitta in calm, lots of Shatapari and Anantamulangi and other positive things, which will be beneficial for pacifying that K2 in Aries. Um, but it is a very strong past life connection where, as Dr. Dharmesh mentioned, K2 is that desire to want to take the form. So if it's taking the form in Aries, it's a desire to progress. It's a desire to grow. It's a desire to evolve. Um, but there will be lots of changes which will happen, um, which the K2 in Aries person might not be suspect, suspecting. So even though they are growing, even though they are advancing, even though they are reaching their goals, it might not be exactly how they thought it would be. It might not look exactly how we thought it, thought, how they thought it would look. And we can understand Rahu's aspect also bringing some cloudiness or some smokiness on the other side. If the K2 is in Aries, the Rahu is in Libra, and there can be this fogginess from that vibration in, as well. So um, that's just a little bit about the K2 in Aries, K2 in the first house. I hope that was interesting for Dr. Darmesh and our viewers, and I'm looking forward very much to hearing about uh, your position on uh, K2 in, in Taurus and K2 in the second house, especially because uh, some astrologers consider that the debilitation sign of the K2. Yeah, very well said about the first house and the Aries. And that's in the beginning itself, I said that when you see the two aspects, then you realize that uh, there is a Two different aspects of the Ketu, you might be getting, our viewers are getting two different uh, views and by combining these, they are getting the complete knowledge. Yeah, that's in the second house when we move to the Ketu and as we know that's a dry planet, Ketu in the second house. A second house is a very social house where we place our family. After us, a very important house is a second house where our social has placed our family has place finance wealth is also a part of the second house but uh, mainly the second house is known is about the sanskara whatever the sanskara we have that is very important in the second house 
and where the ketu in the second house means whatever the uh, past life sanskara you have brought that you are going to evolve in this year this birth so ketu in the second house means that they are not been attached with the family culture but they will develop their own culture i have seen in the ketu in the second house when we, they depart from the family when they leave the family joint family or any family the parents or anyone from the family then only they rise it gives you only one choice to you that uh, if you are getting a relation if you wish a relation you have to sacrifice the finance and if you wish to have a finance then you have to compromise the relationship and that is why whenever the ketu i found in the second house in anybody chart i say that uh, if you wish to develop your relationship just forget about the money and if you wish to earn the money you have to forget about the relationship so that happens in the second house the ketu where you have some sanskara of your past life and uh, you are into this life where you got some different kind of a sanskara so that's that's a trend changing uh, placement of a ketu in the second house that you are going to change something different in your family whatever happens from the earlier age of your grandparents to the grandparents whatever the system has came in your life in your uh, family you are going to change that system and you will be a revolutionary in the family itself so you are going to change the system of a family see suppose a family has a ritual family have some uh, belief uh, that belief they are going to change by the person having a ketu in the second house and they are doing some remarkable things by which the family is being known now in a different way so i believe that the ketu in the second house even though you are attached with the family you are attached with the social but you are more concentrating on the part where whatever the lacuna is there in your family whatever the uh, myth whatever the wrong practice in the family you are going to change so that can change and that changes happens because the rahu is aspecting on from the eighth house and eighth house is an ancestral house so whatever the system whatever the parampara has been brought from the so past the so called past families the values that are going to change that are going to break by this person and that is a break there is a change in the good faith if there is a wrong custom or following in your family in your um, generation that this is the person who are going to change that uh, uh, wrong custom or wrong system which is prevail in your society so i like a ketu in the second house being it's a revolutionary living with the family or not living with the family but there's uh, always a detachment always being balanced always like to bring uh, something change in the family even with the staying with the family or not with staying with the family and these are the people who always speak very less because ketu is uh, such a planet which makes the people dry even though there is a need to speak they keep a silence so this is a one kind of your energy when you are not speaking much you are sending your energy i don't know how much energy we waste in the speaking so many things but we are in the good faith we are speaking so those who are having a ketu in the second house they believe in the deeds rather than the only and only speaking about the things so many people speak about them that they have done this this but they will very less speaking now moving to the uh, sign as a taurus about a people believe taurus ketu is a debilitated and rahu is exalted in taurus but generally in my many videos i say that it is more familiar the rahu is more familiar with the gemini and ketu is a more familiar with the uh, sagittarius so here i don't consider that the ketu being a debilitated in the uh, taurus sign if somebody is believing it's okay for them but here in the sign of a venus the ketu is somewhat comfortable if you have a ketu in the taurus sign that means you have somewhat connection of a ketu by sun moon or mars all three planets are moderate with the ketu they all are enemies to the rahu but it is not considered enemies for the ketu ketu is always moderate with its everyone because it doesn't speak it doesn't interact it doesn't make it's a by silent it produces a result so taurus ketu when ketu is in the taurus house after 
having so many life of a pleasure so many life of a material life now you got even though you have a material pleasure because a taurus is a material sign when you have a taurus because you see the kal purush has given the taurus as a second house which is highly materialistic house see even i am not afraid of saying that the second house being a relation also it is also material see why we need a relation that's a material aspect why we need the money why we need to speak is all the material aspect if you are not speaking if you are a spiritual person if you are a monk if you are sadhu they are always keeping silence because silence is the main wealth so here the ketu in the second uh, taurus sign means even though you have all kind of a material pleasure you will not incline on the material pleasure in fact having all the material pleasure and not enjoying that's the control the ketu has in the taurus sign and maybe because of that the people believe that it's a debilitated it's not a debilitated it's a own control because the ketu has no sense see our all the senses are divided in so many house and so many planet while cutting the head the rahu, rahu is our for uh, this uh, head portion and ketu is a lower body our all the senses lies within this ten inch and rest of the body has no sense even the touch feeling is also that sense is also in, inside the mind so ketu is senseless or there is no sense so having a taurus ketu that means having the pleasure but there is no inclination on the pleasure and even residing and placing with the highly material society they can make themselves aloof from this and this is a beauty of a ketu in the taurus sign having all the kind of a pleasure but not enjoying so that's the beauty of a taurus ketu and as we know that the, this is a sign of earth the aries is a dharma here is a earth so the main purpose of taurus sign is to give you wealth to give you pleasure to enjoy you the life here by keep placing a ketu in the taurus sign that means you are fully loaded with all kind of pleasure but you have a control you know how much to use what is your need and what is your necessity that thin line that is a thin line between your need and your necessity so this uh, ketu in the taurus sign i say that the transformation from need to necessity they have all kind of pleasure but whatever necessary is there they only utilize that much only and they are not going beyond uh, that level and not going behind the need so i like the ketu in the taurus sign and uh, i like the in second house also even though you are with the family but you are always being dry not involving too much inclination toward the relationship because most of the people by going beyond behind behind the relationship relatives they fall Uh, in the problem so here ketu having so many relation having so much wealth they are how to remain in the prudential life why uh, that uh, uh, middle life that's uh, learned by the ketu in the second house so where i uh, completed my aspect of a ketu in the second house and the taurus uh, i say that uh, let him uh, let you put your views about the viewers to get about the uh ketu in the second house and taurus everything you say dr darmesh was so beautifully put and some of the things that you said totally resonate with me i love when we approach ketu in these different positions we approach it from a karmic perspective all of the planets all of the grahas are karmic but i guess some are more karmic than others and ketu is definitely one of the more karmic planets because it contains our past lifetime karmas now when k2 is in the second house that means rahu is in the eighth house rahu rahu has signification in the eighth house which means rahu likes to be in the eighth house so there is this um <clears throat> depending on the sign and everything it 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 means from a past lifetime karmic perspective in your past lifetimes that you focus on your family that you focus on arta you focus on providing for your family you focus on providing for yourself you focus on being a member of the family uh in your past lifetime maybe you depend on your family 
for money and shelter or your family depend on you for money or shelter. That's just from having K2 in the second house. So it's likely to happen again in this lifetime. It's possible too, that either you, your family might depend on you for food and shelter, or you might depend on your family for food and shelter. But Rahu is showing unfulfilled karma. Rahu is showing a desire which must be fulfilled. And when you put all of your family first, and you depend on your family, and, you, and your family depends on you, what, what, what gets left unexplored? It's the eighth house. It's the mystical. It's the occult. It's being alone. It's the renunciation from the family. It's the renunciation from the material world. So they're usually people's Rahu when they have K2 in the second house. There's this part of them which wants to be alone. There's this part of them which wants to say, screw you, family, get rid of you. I'm done with you. I'm done with money. I'm done with family. I don't want to care about these things. I just want to sit here and chant Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya. So K2 in the second house is a very interesting position uh, because of your past lifetime karmic inclination to have so much dependability between you and your family. Now, because this is an art to house, um, the karma might not be complete. So that means that you still might end up being a, um, needing your family's support or your family might need your support. And that could be a natural part of the karmic picture. But the thing is, is it cannot act from a distraction from your spirituality. It cannot act like a distraction from your mysticism. It cannot ask. Um, and K2 in the second house means you could actually be wealthy. You could benefit fi financially from doing something which is the outsider. Because K2 and Rahu are the outsider. So if you have K2 in the second house, you can be good astrologer. You can be good Vastu. You can be good Ayurvedic practitioner. You have all the, you can be good uh, palmistry. You can read the tarot card. Whatever it is which resonate with you. But there is this potential for you. But if you're always putting your family first and always taking care of your family and forgetting what's important to you, well, that's part of the dark karmic pattern that can show up with K2 in the second house. You want to break through that karmic pattern. It doesn't mean that you don't care for your family. It doesn't mean that you don't have a job. But don't forget that Rahu is signification in the eighth house. And there's a lot of mystical experience that wanted to be explored through that position. Um, now, I also don't, in my experience, don't find K2 and Taurus to be debilitation, although I understand why it is considered debilitation. Because K2 is the moksha karaka and Taurus is the most material sign. So you take an energy which is supposed to take away you from the material world and you combine it with an energy from the material world, well, that's going to be a little bit uncomfortable. And that is what Dr. Dharma said. Oftentimes, these people have past lifetime great wealth. Well, guess what happens when you have the same great thing lifetime after lifetime after lifetime? You begin to not appreciate it. You begin to not see the value of it. We cannot even see the value of things unless we've experienced the opposite. That's what Venus and Libra and all sorts of other planets will teach us that one. So if, if, you're, if you're looking at this aspect of K2 and Taurus, it's a blessing and a challenge. Now, right here I have the chart of Bill Gates. We all know Bill Gates. He is the CEO of a big computer company. And we know that his K2 is 26 degrees in Taurus. He is billionaire. He is billionaire. He is billionaire. And luckily, because K2 is significator in 12th house, and he has the K2 in Taurus in 12th house, he gives a lot of money to the charity. But still, there's this, uh, there's this extraordinary amount of wealth that he has absolutely no idea what to do with. People, if, if they had um, extraordinary amount of wealth, like my guru, Amma, every penny that she receives from her organization is going towards proper service. 
is going towards making the country better, is making her schools better, making this world a better place. But the K2 and Taurus energy, it doesn't know what to do with all of their riches. And that is part of why it is uncomfortable. I've seen other charts of people with K2 and Taurus, they are millionaires. And I'm not talking about $1 million. I'm talking about $5 million, $10 million, $20 million. These people are rich. And yet they think they're poor or they try to live, they live like the poor. They, they complain that they don't have enough money. That, that, that's part of the blindness of the K2. It's like you have everything that you could possibly need in the material world, but Rahu is aspecting that in Scorpio, right? So there's more, there's a desire for more, there's, there's a desire to, to, to want, even though you already have everything that you need. So uh, I like that Bill Gates gives lots of his money to charity. But the real evolutionary energy of that K2 in Taurus, it's not a debilitation. You have to understand that um, there is a deeper value to money than the pleasure that it can provide you and, and, and your life. If you can have K2 in Taurus and you can see that the money is actually a tool to make this world a better place, you will become a saint. But otherwise, you can be very confused by how much money you have and have no idea how to spend it. But generally, there is a strong ancestral karma. You're looking at Rohini, um, um, Rigashir. You're looking at these different vibrations here. And it's not, it doesn't mean that you can't be spiritual. Eventually, it will make you want to renunciate the money. Because that's why they say money is not the route to happiness. Okay, that is a lesson that we can all understand and we can all believe. But if you're poor, it's very hard to be happy because you don't have the resources that you need. If you don't have food, shelter, and clothing, it's going to make it harder to be happy. Um, but they also say the rich man's heaven is the poor man's hell. When you have all this money in the world, and you don't know how to use it properly, you don't know that it's from God, you don't know how to put it in the proper organization, that can be difficult karma. That's why they call the K2 and Taurus debilitation. It's not debilitation though, because you can have extraordinary wealth, but there's lots of lessons in understanding the true spiritual value of that wealth. And it's not just in the pleasure that it can provide. So I hope that was interesting and looking forward to third house in Gemini, sir. <laughs> yeah, very well said. Uh, that's a view very well matched that uh, on the material side cannot be in a person to go with the reincarnation, means a moksha. So that's the main concept about uh, not being in the Taurus uh, ablation. Now moving uh, ahead to the third house, uh, Third house is uh, extraordinary deeds or what we call as uh, something special work we assign to, we supposed to do is our third house. That is why we call as a new venture, new beginning, new things. All the new things first comes in our dream, first comes in our subconscious mind. So it's a place of our subconscious mind also and by which the K2 is giving a direction. See, Rahu and Ketu is always been considered good in the Upachaya Sthana. Upachaya means 3, 6, 10 and 11, we all know. So why it is called better in the Upachaya Sthana? Because they both are, Rahu and Ketu, both are sharing its own energy. It never derives energy from others, but they have their own different kind of energies. And that the two life force or two dimension of uh, planets. When Ketu plays in the third house, means your Rahu is in the ninth house. So some religious things you have forget to do in the past life and because of that there is some curse on you and you have to fulfill that in this life. This is a journey of a search. When Ketu in third house I say it's your journey of search. What to search? You only will realize. When Ketu is in third house you yourself only realize what kind of a journey or search you have begin with and they are the people who always fail i've seen 
they fail in so many events they fail in so many uh, incidents they fail in so many projects but one project makes them a multi millionaire or a big personality why because they are in journey of search when you are journey of search you will don't know what is your destination you don't know where you have to reach and because of you are not knowing of where you have to reach half of a life because we all know the ketu maturity age is a 48 in one of my video of maturity of planet i say the last phase of uh, maturity is a ketu between 42 to 48 is a time of maturity of ketu and we all seen that the transformation of a people's life start in between this age of 42 to 48 this is a real time where people achieve their peak of their life and while you are in the peak this is a right time to get out of that uh, position and create something new this is a third house ketu where you are in search of a journey you will be always been inclined to do something new what others cannot even think about it and that is why third house is a house where you have to do something new things about the things which other cannot see see it is a, also a secret to secret house because secret house we all know it's a eight and third house is a eight to eight so to search and to get that this is a secret is a ketu in third house while ketu is in third house you search a secret which is still being secret to others see like a uh, many scientists have seen ketu in third house whole of their life has been un- under the secret only to search uh, what is a secret and they reveal so many secrets by accidentally you see all the big uh, invention has been done in the accidental mode they are going to search something different and they across something different so that is a ketu in third house uh, i don't know uh, many people know about the uh, columbus journey so it's like a journey of a columbus he need to search the india but he reached to uh, us so it's like that that you are going to search somewhere else and you reach to some different destination but for world this is also a search research while we say is a research a ketu is a right planet of a research because search everybody can see by their own eyes well, whatever you find from your eyes is a search and what you can find from your inner thought inner voice that is a research means you have searched something which has been re repeated or re uh, with the authority you have find something that is a research and ketu in third house is a, just nothing but the discovery of a research is a research to research search of a research and uh, third house ketu again it's a lot of a journey will happen because the third house is for the short journey you will be more connected with the people who are totally different from your caste community and religion these are the uh, benefit of a ketu in third house that you will be attached with the so many surrounding people which other don't know see sometimes people are always have a tendency to uh, reside with the tribal people there are a lot of in discovery you will find such kind of a thing that people have gone to the uh, woods or in the jungle and uh, search a new people search the new the life where we are not aware about it is all the tribal life so this is a journey of a ketu in third house and many many adventure many many new research will be found by ketu in the third house while talking about the gemini ketu it is a totally a different energy by having ketu in third house is a blessing when the ketu in the gemini is not called as a blessing why it is not like call as a blessing because you cannot use your logical brain when ketu in the gemini why it is a debilitated because a gemini sign by uh, original kal purusha is a third house third house is uh, your communication your thoughts your belief is all in the third house where ketu is in the house your inner sense is not allowing your logical mind whatever things comes in front of us firstly is in the logical mind and while we are applying it into the our sense with our five sense we test it 
it's a litmus test really a litmus test when somebody tell us that if this planetary position is this 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 will happen we don't accept everything by what we say i believe that what i say or you say people do, generally doesn't accept and that we see in the uh, below comments that i have this different view i have this this is a good thing because we have also our own uh, this uh, mind and other also have their own mind but to convince them is a gemini sign so all the logical things which the gemini sign is born with with the mercury mercury we all know the application of mind this is a soft sign of a mercury and the virgo is a hard sign of a mercury there are always a two sign we divide into the own sign and the mula trikon but i say this is a soft sign and the hard sign every planet where it is mul trikon is a hard sign hard sign means it can't be changed whereas in the soft sign the it has a chance to manipulate so here the manipulation of mercury is possible with the communication suppose i say something and if you are not agree or the viewers are not agree then i come to know that people are not agreeing with my things so i will change my views i will change the mind of the people i mean to this i was not I was supposed to say this this kind of manipulation people do that manipulation only happens in the gemini sign it cannot be happen in the virgo sign virgo has a very strong belief yes then yes only and no then no only but gemini people you can turn because it's a male female or dual sign or whatever so that a logical changing sign while ketu is placed ketu has its own traits and it cannot be changed because this all the belief has come from the past life how you can deny anything of a past life which has already been happened so that is why it is not been so comfortable the ketu in the gemini sign because gemini needs a logic whereas ketu has no logic because it has no sense that the reality you have to face which ketu cannot be accept and gemini sign cannot be tolerate so because of that uh, two uh, pole two different pole of a ketu and the gemini sign it has not been matching although ketu doesn't have any enmity with the mercury I think we fixed it. You're good. Sorry, there was an interruption in between. So what I say that uh, whatever the two different pole, when there is a two different pole of a Gemini and a, uh, this Mercury, they always a uh, Ketu always goes with the uh, pole of uh, its own uh, senses rather than convincing or manipulating of a Gemini. and that is why it is not been called as a suitable sign for the ketu because it doesn't change its uh, belief ketu doesn't change its belief wherever the gemini are the people or gemini is a sign where the, the logic can change your belief so that is why it is not so been comfortable for the ketu with the very hard code very strong belief and that is why it is not been considered although the gemini sign start with the mars rahu and jupiter etc somewhat a comfortable for the ketu but still insidely it is supported but outsidely ketu cannot change its own belief and that is why there is always a conflict of a ketu in the gemini sign so that is a little uh, uh, outcome of a ketu in third house and the gemini uh, you may produce uh, something different and uh, good lights on that thank you thank you dr darmesh ji as always very informative and appreciated um When I like to think about K2 in the 3rd house, I'll use a few different words, but one is influence. The 3rd house is the influence we have, the intentions we set, the motivations, the ambition. So a lot of influence comes out of the 3rd house. When K2 is in there, that means in the past lifetime, um there uh you were easily influenced. So in this lifetime you see Rahu aspecting in the 9th house. This would be much uh saying that okay, I'm going to be influenced, but I'm not going to let other people influence me. I'm going to question my guru, 
I'm going to question my father. I'm going to question the society and the organized religion and the religious law. And I'm going to question the dogma. And that is because for many, many lifetimes, I have my own intentions. I have my own feelings. I have my own understanding. Now, this is a house of seeking and searching, and I love that Dr. Dharmesh put it that way. Now, these people with K2 in the third house, it's considered an upachaya position. So it is considered a favorable position just by that alone. When the nodes are in an upachaya position, it encourages your evolution with that energy. So it will encourage you to actually want to work on yourself, to work on your karma. You know, I mean, what's, what's better in life? Having hard karma and your chart wants you to ignore it or having hard karma and your chart is encouraging you to always be working on it so you may resolve it. Definitely the latter. So that is why K2 is very good position in the third house. Now, this is a term of short-term travel. So people with K2 in the third house, they often find themselves traveling to different locations, maybe not permanent re, uh, relocation, but they find themselves going from this place to that place for this or that opportunity. Now, one of the things that K2 can show is a void, but not always is the void literal. Sometimes is the void is metaphorical, but we understand that the third house is the house of the siblings, specifically the younger siblings. So sometimes people with K2 in the third house, they're the oldest sibling. That is one possibility. It also could show that they're the only child. That, 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 that they have no siblings. Um, and this energy means that all of the parents' attention, which might have something to do with that Rahu in the ninth house, especially with the father, is solely focused on the single child. So he's telling the single child, this is how you should be. This is how I want you to be. This is how I want you to form. And eventually the K2 person with the K2 in the third house, they'll want to break free of all of this. I don't want to be like you, dad. I don't want to be like you, mom. I want to be my own person. And they will choose a lifestyle for themselves, possibly from traveling to a foreign and exotic location where they can truly be themselves where they can truly kind of um, allow themselves to figure out their identity without the influence of religion, without the influence of their family. So sometimes people with K2 in the third house and Rahu in the ninth house, they break outside of the religion that they were born into. They, 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 they break free of it. So if they're Christian, they break free out of Christian. If they're Amish, they break free out of Amish. If they're Hasidic Jewish, they'll break free of the Hasidic Jewish. They'll break free of the most, especially the most conservative organized aspect of that religion. Because Rahu in the ninth house and Ketu in the third house, it is seeking. It is seeking. That means you can't be given the answer. See, that's the thing about religion sometimes. It wants to give you all the answers. But if, you're, but if you're given all the answers, then what type of seeking are you doing for yourself? None. You're just blind faith believing all of the answers you're giving. So K2 in the third house is seeking your own answers, trying to find the truth, trying to reach your potential, traveling. And it's an upachaya vibration. So there's a lot of transformation to wanting to become a better person or to wanting to become the best person that you can be. These people can be very into self-help, um, you know, bettering themselves. This is also a physical house so they can, uh, and a communication house, so they can be very influential communicators. K2 in the third house, if it's in a good position, when they communicate with you, they change your mind after they communicate with you. So this is very good position for someone uh, who wants to be a public speaker, politician, or teacher or any, um, because it's aspecting the Rahu in the ninth house too, someone who can have strong influence on someone, someone who can very be pow powerful and transformative in their communications. So that's just a little bit about what I wanna say about K2 in the third house, which I like a little bit more than K2 in Gemini. 
Now, I'm not saying that K2 in Gemini is completely debilitated, although by many fashions it is considered to be, just like Taurus, one of the more difficult or debilitation signs of the K2. Even though K2 and Mercury are somewhat neutral towards each other, K2 is this planet, planet of moksha and spiritual intuition. Mercury is the planet of logic, rational, intellect. So when you combine these energies together, they can get very uncomfortable. They can get very uh, kind of, uh, um, it, especially if it's aspected by the, uh, the Rahu in, in, um, in uh, Capricorn, correct? No, in uh, Sagittarius. Rahu in Sagittarius. So it's aspected by the Rahu in Sagittarius. So they're, they're, they're trying to understand something logically that can't be understood logically, which is why the Rahu in Sagittarius is saying, well, if you have to understand it logically, then you better just try to be the best person you can be. Because when it comes to understanding God, when it comes to understanding the supernatural existence of nature and metaphysics, um, our brain is only capable of understanding such a small percentage of that. And yet the K2 and the Gemini person, they will want to be able to understand it. They'll say, How, well, this, I want to understand reincarnation. How does it logically work? I want to understand astrology. How does it logically work? Well, um, how, what does God look like? Uh, and what, and uh, do we get to talk to God when they die? They answer all the, they ask all the impossible questions that there is no absolute answer to. It's because their mind is trying to understand spirituality logically. And although that is beautiful to try to explain spirituality logically, and a good K2 Mercury combination is good for people like you and me, Dr. Darmesh, uh, who want to do astrology or they want to do other occult sciences because we're taking something which is spiritual but we're also explaining it logically and scientifically. So maybe someone with K2 and Gemini, their best way of understanding spirituality could be through a spiritual science like Ayurveda or Jyotish or Vastu or yoga, something like this, which has a much more scientific background to it. But blind faith believing in things and trying to understand what we can understand spiritually and metaphysically through our mind, through our logic, is very strong with the K2 in Gemini. Um, very interestingly enough, on a positive side, um, it can create um, a challenging energy of having a difficult relationship with technology. But I've also seen some aspects where if it's in the third house and it's in a good position, the person improves their relationship with technology over time. And then they might actually become quite profound or quite pro quite innovative within technology. So even though initially it's not the best for your relationship with technology, by working with it, it encourages it to grow over time, especially if it's in, within a good position of the chart. Um, but because K2 is in Gemini, the buddhi is spread out wide. And K2 is already very erratic. So that means sometimes K2 in Gem Gemini the person wants to, oh, I want to study this for three days. I want to study this for three days. I want to study this for two days. I want to, and they jump from one thing to the other. They jump from one thing to the other because it's hard to focus and study just on the one thing because the K2 wind, Gemini energy, fire, it's all very erratic and unpredictable. So again, part of the remedy of that vibration is, okay, it's normal for you to be attracted to many different areas of study but try to stick with something. Try to stick with something that you have started and follow through the studying of that to the very end. You might, they're the jack of many trades, master of none. So it doesn't mean that you have to study it permanently, but you have to focus on the study so you get the information that you need before you can move on to studying and starting something else. So again, they can be very distracted in terms of their study, but it does benefit them to kind of zone in and focus in on studying two or three different things and not being distracted from those things. Um, but, but more than one, because it's Gemini, but not more than 
four, five, this is too many things to focus on. Just pick a few things, focus on them, and you'll notice your intellectual energies are much more uh, uh, stronger that way. Um, so I hope that was interesting on third house, Gemini uh, K2, uh, Gemini K2, and I look forward to hearing Dr. Darmesh on cancer and the fourth house. <laughs> Yeah, you go into so much uh, deep root and sometimes uh, we feel that uh, while listening our own video when uh, I also listen, I say that okay, I have speak this thing but I have left this thing. So there are always been so many things to be speak. But uh, still, I believe that uh, we both are giving uh, justice to the topic. So that is a somewhat a satisfaction I have. The one of a reason of uh, starting my own channel or being spreading this knowledge is uh, nothing but to give up to the society. And that is a good thing about the Ketu. When Ketu allow you to share something, that means that has been left with you in past life and that you have unable to share. So Ketu in the house is, it says that uh, that house energy you have utilized maximum in the past life. And because of uh, overuse, overdose of that use of your past life, this life it has been frozen, this life it has been uh, uh, dry up, it has been uh, covered, so that you are not focusing on that and you are focusing on the part of a Rahu. And it also says, see, there are so many theories uh, prevailing that uh, wherever the Ketu is placed in this life, the Rahu was there in the earlier life. So you have done so much. Uh, uh, accelerate your things and because of the more accelerating that things uh, it has been now there need to be uh, some full stop or some comma some dry some uh, vacuum to be created and that is why the K2 is placed in this house in this life very well uh, and very well applied when K2 in fourth house why have uh, built that background it is to uh, understand the K2 in the fourth house when Ketu is in fourth house, means you have all kind of a pleasure, but unable to enjoy that pleasure. You have a big house, you have a big car, but you are not uh, able to enjoy. Every time you are moving one to another place for your work or for your pleasure, so your your bungalows, your flat, your uh, residence has been always utilized by others. You have created, but uh, utilized by others. Sometimes you have to leave your birthplace because the fourth house we believe is your birthplace. So your birthplace doesn't give you a credit, it doesn't give you a way out. And to search your real uh, uh, purpose of your life, you have to move out. And whenever a K2 in the fourth house, I always advise the people just come out from your birthplace. Then only you will realize what potential you have. Because in the same place, you, your act, your deeds will not be recognized because Rahu in the 10th house. So you have to create your workplace something different from where your origin or where your father has been there. So you have to move out and you have to do your own things and that support by the Ketu in the 4th house. So Ketu in the 4th house, a highly materialistic house. 4th house is nothing but the materialist house. See, Second house is itself a material, whereas fourth house is a material pleasure. What the material pleasure we get is all the fourth house. In second house, we got a resources to purchase the material things. Now in fourth house, we have, we possess the material things. That is why the Mars comes in front, that's a property, land, all the uh, buildings, residence place is a Mars. Then Venus, it says uh, luxury, comfort, cars, jewelry, all the luxury things. So, and Mercury is uh, your intellectual property. So, all this property which uh, you have acquired by the wealth is all about to enjoy by the fourth house. And where the Ketu is, please. See, fourth house, we all believe it's the uh, last time before just we end up our life. People consider past 10 years of uh, our life. Then 8th house is the exact moment where you live, about to live this earth. That is 8th house. 
and twelfth house is after your death where you go. So fourth house is nothing but the preparation of uh, your next journey. Also, we consider uh, ten years before your um, uh, life or before your ending of a life or death is a fourth house. So while the uh, Ketu is in the fourth house, as seen by creating so many wealth in abroad or overseas, by creating so much name, fame, recognition, then people come back to their birthplace. In the past uh, 10 years, 15 years, they come back to your, their origin place and then they serve the nation. So such a kind of a Ketu in the fourth house means having material pleasure, but how to make yourself aloof, how to make yourself balanced with available resources. Everybody have a house, but house is only place to reside, to recharge yourself, not to rest, not to being uh, too much involved in the pleasure. That is not a fourth house. That is not your residence. You have to just to have a break of your deeds is a fourth house or your residence place. But this is a fourth house where the Ketu is placed. Then you have a material pleasure, but you never so much affection, attraction of that pleasure. In how in many people I have seen that uh, in Bombay, we find so many people who have left their villages, they have left their own town, own birthplace, and now they are putting more hard work in the uh, city like uh, Bombay. So what happens that uh, if we ask that uh, how much wealth you have, they say we have uh, too much big bungalows in our uh, uh, native place, but we are doing hard work here. Why? Because you have a pleasure, but you can't enjoy that. You have to create new things, new pleasure in new place. So whenever the Ketu in fourth house, just leave your birthplace, leave your mother, leave your origin and start something new. That is a good mantra for Ketu being in the fourth house. You are not came here to enjoy pleasure. You came here to create the pleasure. It is your duty to the society to create the pleasure and give it to them. Either your own family members or to the society. So that is a... Yeah. The timing of uh, uh, fourth house is uh, exact midnight. We all know it's uh, exact midnight time of uh, 12 at the uh, uh, early morning, what we call, is uh, exactly a fourth house. And that is a time when the Ketu is in fourth house. That means in the night, your so many things are being planted. And you should be utilize your that potential energy by planting so many good thoughts in your mind during the night time. And now coming to the cancer, the Ketu in the cancer. Now here, it's uh, I like a moon and Rahu together, but I am not so comfortable with the moon and Ketu. See, the moon has a two child. That's a, one is the Mercury and another is a Rahu. That's a two node of a moon. Moon, we all know moon is a mood. Our mood is uh, governed by the moon. One has a logical mood or logical mind, that is a mercury. And one is a illogical or uh, we call it as a subconscious mind. A conscious mind is a mercury and subconscious mind or uh, unconscious mind is a Rahu. So that is why when the Rahu and moon is there, then you have a more inclination, you have a direct connection to switch on and switch off your conscious and subconscious mind. You can have a balance between the conscious and subconscious mind. But when moon and Ketu is there, why I am telling this, that is a Ketu placement in the Cancer having also a some same inclination of a moon and Ketu. Moon and Rao is also creating Grahan Yoga and moon Ketu is also creating Grahan Yoga. When moon Rao is there, you are accepting everything and you are reflecting also simultaneously. Whatever you learn, Whatever you earn, you spend also. Whereas Moon and Ketu is that you are absorbing, you are realizing the new potential, new uh, mood of your uh, body, but you are not able to reflect. And that makes a confusion. You know, the lunatic, idiot, these all are the different categories of Moon Ketu and Moon Rahu. Whereas uh, schizophrenic is also a part of a uh, uh, mood where the complex develop of uh, inferior complex or the superior complex. That's a schizophrenic uh, nature is being created by the moon Ketu. So that is why when the Ketu is in the cancer sign is also reflecting because Ketu has in the container of a moon. 
is in the container the sign i always believe is being a container where the planet lies so the container of uh, ketu itself is a moon and which is not so comfortable for ketu and that is why the dryness has been created in your mind your mood and that is why you are not able to reflect your actual mood actual uh, sensation actual your emotions to the people sometime in the cancer uh, ketu when the ketu is in the cancer sign that means you really feel something but you cannot express and because of non expression of your moods non expression of your things the people take you other way people misunderstood you and because of that there's a distance always increase so the ketu in the cancer sign it is always been created dry mood or they are not able to express their mood and suppose this uh, sign has been placed in the 6th house or 8th house that is a worse condition of a ketu in the seated in the 6th and 8th house or 12th house 12th house is considered as a moderate for the ketu but if uh, it is in the cancer sign in the 6th and 8th house that means you are getting all the energy from the cosmic rays cosmic energies but you cannot express you cannot identify you cannot define it and because of that you are creating confusion within and that is why a good aspect should also be there for the ketu in the cancer but the more dominatingly the person are getting a negative shade of a ketu in the sign of a moon and that is why if you have a sign a cancer sign ketu then you must be somewhat a social you should be expressive you should create your own circle if you are shy in the nature if you cannot express your things then you write everything great poet i have seen great writer i have seen ketu and moon why because they can plot they can think about this and when they reduce in writing they become famous but when they are good expressive they like a poet they are either a expressive also that is a moon rahu and when they cannot express they just leave their poems unknownly and some people discover them and then they become a great so that is a cancer ketu and um, uh, definitely i have completed the fourth house ketu as a dry and cancer also it is also not uh, so comfortable sign for the ketu not to express uh, because uh, cancer is a first emotional sign it's a own house of a moon where the ketu is placed which is having a no sense so it cannot be expressive so that is why the emotion comes they are about to feel they are about to say they are about to cry but cannot cry they see that uh, what is the situation how i can cry so that kind of uh, dryness that kind of a schizophrenic nature one can find in the ketu uh, moon or ketu in the cancer so that is a short uh, discussion about the ketu in fourth house and uh, cancer i have and uh, i'll be eagerly waiting that uh, my friend sanati will also uh, uh, put uh, his inputs about this too thank you well, Dr. Dharmesh, I have to say you covered about everything there is to cover when it comes to these energies, but I just want to explain them in a different way since we always tend to agree upon these things. I'm just going to explain it a little bit differently. Whenever you see the K2 in the fourth house, you understand that Rahu is aspecting in the 10th house. So you have the fourth house, 10th house access there between Rahu and K2. Now, when K2 is in the fourth house, this is the house of home. So I've seen many conditions throughout my uh, research where the person is living away from the land of their ancestors, the person is living away from the land that they were born, a person can even become a refugee, which means through certain military actions or whatever, they're actually forced out of their country. Um, and so K2 in the fourth house can be a difficult karma because the fourth house is where the home is. And because K2 is there, there's lots of transformative and erratic energies there. So constantly they are searching for the home. I agree with Dharmesh Bhai that later in their life, there's nothing better for them than to finally settle down somewhere that they can call home, where they can put their feet in the sand and they can ground and they can relax, and they can say that this is the home that I have worked so hard for. But is it an easy journey to get there? Not necessarily. Again, you have Rahu aspecting in the 10th house of career. So maybe they have job opportunities. 
which take them certain places, but those places are not where they want to live. Another interesting note about K2 in the fourth house, just because I do the astrocartography, and I notice with people who have K2 in the fourth house, if they have bad astrocartography, their life can be very poor if they're living in a bad location for themselves geographically. If they have K2 in the fourth house and they're living near more one of their auspicious lines, living closer to one of their benefit lines in their chart, this will be a much more positive place for them. Um, but because the fourth house also represents the home and the early childhood and the family, there can be certain conflicts with the mother. There can be certain traumas that happened in the early childhood. So it really does kind of benefit the person to, it, it doesn't mean that they don't come back to their homeland eventually, but it does benefit them to leave at some point, travel the world and see new experiences. And because Rahu is in their 10th house of career, maybe they will have greater career success in a foreign land. Maybe they will have greater financial material success in a foreign place. But as mentioned by Dharmesh Bhai, there's a moksha vibration associated with the fourth house, eighth house, and twelfth house. And a lot of people misconceive how strong of a moksha vibration there is in the fourth house. So when you have the moksha karika planet in the fourth house with the moksha, uh, with the moksha vibration of the fourth house, we have to let go of things around home. Maybe we have to let go of our homeland. Maybe we have to let go of our relationship with our mother. Maybe we have to let go of a job which is, in, which is holding our, us back and not allowing us to reach our full potential. But letting us go of these things, uh, Om Gam Ganapataye Namaha, Ganesh removes all of the obstacles from our life. And from there we can experience certain bliss. And so there is this real blissful energy of K2 in the fourth house once you find the right place to be living, once you find the right community to be living in once you break free of your constraints and all of the aspects which are limiting your freedom. And that can be geographically. Certain countries limit their freedoms. Certain um, places, because of the people that live there, they limit our freedoms. If you have K2 in the fourth house, you have to break free of that vibration. It's very important. Now, um, K2 in the fourth house is the past lifetime karma, and it has this energy of the land of our ancestors. And so even though people with K2 in the fourth house might at times find themselves living away from the land of their ancestors, they're still supposed to be a patriot towards their land. That means even if I leave the country, I still love the country that I was born in. I still ha have so much love for the country that I was born in. You know, I, I, I think of great gurus like Yogananda, who he spent so much time in the United States building ashrams and everything, but he would always go back to India and his love for his homeland was insurmountable. So K2 in the fourth house, very strong vibration. Uh, it, it, it's a very strong karmic vibration in terms of the home and it can kind of bring you outside of your homeland and your relationship with your family to experience unexpected things. And eventually, it does benefit the person to stabilize around the energy of the home. Now, when we're looking at K2 in Cancer, uh, it's a little bit more challenging vibration. Not that K2 in the fourth house is an easy vibration, but K2 in Cancer, K2 likes to eat the moon for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So when K2 is eating up the moon like this, that's the mental energies. See, K2 is moksha, loss, and karika. See, let's say someone like, we lose a dog. Uh, we have a pet dog. We lose a dog. We cry, we're sad, then we let it go. We lose our grandparent. We cry, we're sad, then we let it go. Even if we lose someone close to us, like a close friend, we cry, we grieve, we let go of it, we move on, we try to keep going on with our lives. K2 in cancer is a difficult position for that because it shows that when things affect us emotionally, like the losses, if we lose pet, if we lose family member, if we lose friend, that grief, it can stay with us for a long while. We feel the emotional suffering. We miss the person. We feel the sadness. We feel the pain. 
We can see this with the cancer vibration in general. But when K2 in there, there's a lot of loss that the person might have to experience throughout their lifetime. And that loss is really going to hit them in their heart. Just like with K2 in the fourth house. The fourth house is the house of the chest. So it's going to hit them in their heart. So this K2 in the cancer vibration, it's very, very, very intense in terms of the emotional impact that things have on people. Now, it also gives you empathic intuition if you have K2 in cancer. That means you're going to be able to feel what other people feel. So if other people are feeling positive, spiritual, happy, selfless, generous, you get a natural high off their positive vibrations. But you have Rahu aspecting uh, K2. So that means that sometimes people are going to, you're going to, their energies are going to weaken you. They're going to bring you down. They're going to sadden you. They're going to lower you. So one of the remedial aspects that I like to bring in for K2 in cancer is to have very strong emotional boundaries. And this means because of your empathic intuition, try to surround yourself with people who have emotional maturity, who are emotionally going to lift you up, and not people who are sad and depressed and are emotionally going to be taking you down. Because there is a vulnerability to that with K2 in cancer. So that's just a little bit of K2 in cancer, K2 in the fourth house. And I'm looking forward to hearing your insights on the fifth house and Leo. Uh, it's a very unique position, um, Dr. Darmesh, and I hope that was interesting. Yeah, definitely. And uh, very well said about the Ketu in the fourth house. And uh, that's the same thing I said that our uh, views are very much into the align. And that is uh, only two dimension we always describe. So well, uh, while entering in the Ketu in the fifth house, everything becomes silent. Because the fifth house is our past life. Ketu itself is a past life. Whatever the deeds we have done in the past life is nothing but the, it's a reflection of by the Ketu. What we do for the next life is a Rahu. But whatever we done in the earlier life, in the previous birth, that is all about the Ketu. And here, the two forces of a past life join together. And that is the beauty of a Ketu in the fifth house. So you got a chance. Ketu in first house, Ketu with the sun, Ketu Mahadasha and Ketu place in the fifth house. I said the four different uh, category of a Ketu. We have already discussed in the Ketu in the Aries and Ketu Dasha. But here, when Ketu in the fifth house means all your past life deeds has been hidden. So you got an opportunity. You got an opportunity in this life to create a new deeds. See, while considering the Ketu in the fifth house, we agree that the Rahu is in the eleventh house. Eleventh house, so many things can be seen, but the ultimate thing from the eleventh house is the desire fulfillment. So, irrespective of what deeds we you have performed in the past life, you are going to enjoy, you are going to complete your desire fulfillment. Why it is happened? Because Ketu has still been covered with your past life deeds. So to whom you have meted in the earlier life, to whom you have already been uh, exchanged the deeds, done something for him, or he might have done something for you, it is a Ketu in the fifth house means this is a some kind of a pose it is given. And whatever the desire you have of a present life that you enjoy, and then you will be adding or subtracting from your fifth house. Is a house of child. Many people uh, see and tell that the uh, Ketu in fifth house or Rahu in fifth house gives a problem in progency. If you have a Ketu and Rahu in this house, so to whom you are looking for? See, for, uh, with the two people, we have a highest deed section. One is our spouse and another is our child. Because to whom we are going to live for uh, 20 years. 25 years, 30 years, 40 years and every day you are exchanging some deeds with each other, with the spouse and with the children. Spouse will cover in the 7th house majorly but that uh, uh, seeded in the 5th house itself and uh, most is uh, your child. 
so whatever the deeds or whatever the good deeds you have done with the people you will not find in this life because they are being hidden you are given you you will be given an opportunity to deal with the new people by putting a rahu in the 11th house you are socially so much connected with so uh, so many people because 11th house is a social house so you will be connected with the so many people again the rahu in the upjaya house and by aspecting rahu in the 5th house means all your deeds being recorded in the 5th house and that whatever you have completed your own desire from other people in next life you are going to be whatever you have get from them so ketu in 5th house means it is somewhat pose hided your past life deeds past life connection with the people and that is why it takes us so much time to bring the new generation child birth it takes a problem because you will be getting some random people in your life not the real people what you are seeking about so ketu in fifth house sometimes people call as a pitru dosh pitru dosh is nothing but uh, to whom you have a ancestor you will not find a way to come back to the same family that's uh, what the hindu mythology believe and it's not a mythology it's a real belief we have that the ketu in fifth house means you are not meeting a right person to whom you have some a uh, real connection of a past life but you are meeting a random people to whom you are either creating either exchanging your deeds and by way of the ketu in the fifth house all your desire will be fulfilling because rahu plays in the 11th house so about the creativity because uh, fifth house i believe is a house of creativity what you create in the earlier time earlier life before the ket uh, this birth whatever you have been created that is kept aloof and you will be given an opportunity start from e suppose you have completed your education see fifth house is a higher education you have completed your higher education your bachelor degree your master degree then suddenly you will come to know that this degree has no meaning i have interest in this field and then you will acquiring something new and different uh, knowledge this is a ketu in fifth house so you will be not gain from your own knowledge because your own knowledge is been kept for something different aspect and you are jumping from commercial aspect uh, commercial uh, education to a scientific research or from one field to totally a different or new dimension field because whatever the education you acquire is not been connected with your deeds and you you have to uh, proceed some different deeds and many time it happens that ketu in fifth house you have to turn your life you have to turn your education line suppose you have decided here that uh, you wish to become a doctor but you might not get a desire or expected percentage so then you have to end up with the finding some different line in the engineering or commercial line and ultimately that uh, becoming a doctor become a dream for you why because the, your past life deed is not getting you support from this and you have to create something new and you have to fulfill your wish now entering into the uh, ketu in the leo sign see what happens that the sun ketu relation we call as a grahan yoga again sun rahu is still something better that your soul is uh, absorbing certain energy by the rahu whereas your soul is being covered by the ketu in the leo or ketu in the uh, with the sun we are talk talking about the ketu in the sign of a leo see leo again start with the magha nakshatra again the uh, uh, position of uh, uh, ketu placement as uh, i mentioned that the brahma chakra your brahma chakra is ashwini it is in aries in the uh, ketu in the aries sign while belly button when you have a belly button that is a perfect place of a ketu in the magha nakshatra magha is exactly a belly button so here the ketu what a place in the sign of a leo because leo is a kalpurush fifth house fifth sign that is stomach that is your intestine that is a place of uh, your belly button and by curing and by uh, applying some medicinal properties in the belly button you may acquire a good health so that is a secret of ayurveda that is given in the ketu in the magha nakshatra or ketu in the leo sign 
I somewhat like better Ketu in the Leo than the Ketu in the uh, earlier sign of a uh, uh, Cancer, because here the Ketu is absorbing certain aspect of uh, uh, your soul. It is uh, uh, maturing. It is developing something new in your uh, Atma, in your soul, and sometime you may realize. What is your purpose of journey of this life? Ketu in the Leo sign, I have seen many times that they are being uh, uh, intuition. They are getting some intuition of uh, what they have to supposed to do. So they leave everything what they are doing presently and they, they turn completely a 90 degree or 180 degree. Sometimes 360 degree turn they will take during the Ketu. Either transit in the Leo or either they have a placement of a Ketu in the Leo sign. We all have just three years before we have experienced the Ketu in the Leo sign and there are great changes of a spirituality, of a astrological things has been evaluated in the sign when the Ketu was in the Leo sign. So there is a Ketu in the Leo sign, some of the better things, your good deeds of your past life being somewhat helpful it is not good for the Ketu in the fifth house as a placement, but somewhat it is better while Ketu is absorbing the energy of a Leo sign. So energy of a Leo sign says that give focus to your soul, give the direction to your soul and where the Ketu is in the Leo sign, that means you are somewhat directing your soul towards the journey of a Moksha. So somewhat a Cancer uh, Ketu is uh, not so favorable, but the Ketu in the Leo, Ketu in the Simha Rashi is somewhat better. So that is somewhat an input about the Ketu of uh, fifth house. I say that uh, whatever you have created be not been utilized and you have to create something new. And while touching the Ketu in the Leo sign, that means some soul has something hidden inside that you have to bring outside. So that is a two different aspect of a Ketu in the fifth house and Leo sign. Suppose these two com combination comes together. If you bond in the Aries ascendant, obviously the fifth house will carry the Leo sign and fifth house Ketu also will be there. So Ketu is in fifth house as well as Ketu in the Leo sign. There, somewhat you will get a connection with your people to whom your soul has met in the earlier life and you will be going to pay them you will be always going to pay them. See, in Rahu Dasa, whatever the things you have to uh, take from others, they will come and give you. In Ketu Dasa, whatever things you have to give to the people, you will go and give them. So this is an opportunity. This is a time whereby you have to, whatever you have to give, you will able to give them. So that is a good combination. If the Ketu plays in the Leo in the fifth house, that's a two different good aspect of this. So that much... Uh, uh, in, uh, my inputs about the Ketu in 5000 Leo and I eagerly waiting for Shanati to put his own inputs about this. Thank you Dr. Dharmesh. I really appreciate everything what you share and uh, as a Ketu Leo myself, uh, I, uh, I, I appreciate a lot of what you said, it resonates with me. Now, when we're looking at K2 in the fifth house, we're looking at a past lifetime karma planet in a past lifetime karma house. So there's a lot of a karma being associated with this house. And it's also a Dharma house. So these are the deeds which you, uh, from your past life, which you're carrying into in this lifetime. And how are they going to, how are you going to carry them into this lifetime? Now, one of the attributions of the fifth house is that is the house of romance. Now, seventh house is for marriage and everything, but we find attraction and romance within the fifth house. This means that we can be attracted to people who we have past lifetime karmic connection with. This means the people that come into your life, what you feel a connection to, possibly even romantically or attractively, you might have a past lifetime connection to these people. Now, that can either be a really good thing or that can be a really bad thing. Because you can have, um, that means if you have a girlfriend and you go through horrible breakup with them, but you still have K2 in the fifth house, let's try the relationship again. Then you break up with them. 
Let's try the relationship third time. And the definition of insane is to do the same thing over and over again, expecting there to be a different result. So K2 in the fifth house can be a little crazy in terms of us going back into these old patterns romantically with ex-girlfriends, ex-boyfriends, ex-partners, people we've already tried to walk that road with. Now, it's different if you feel a past lifetime karmic connection with someone that you haven't explored in this lifetime. Then maybe you should explore that a little bit because just like as we mentioned earlier, just because you have karma there doesn't mean the karma is complete. So maybe they were your partner in, your, in their past lifetime, but one of you became a widow or something horrible happened to one of you and you didn't get to be partners for that long. So now they come back into your life in this lifetime and you get to have a longer relationship with them. So consider this as a possibility. Um, don't go back to your old ex-boyfriends and girlfriends. More so look for that soul connection, that, you're, that, that soulmate connection from your past lifetimes to tap into that vibration. Now, this is mentioned in education. So a lot of times people with K2 in the fifth house, as Dr. Dharmesh Bayanchin, their educational route changes. They have interest in this, they are studying that, then all of a sudden they have interest in something else and they are studying that. And this is also true for K2 and Leo to some extent. And so you also find yourself um, following these different routes of education and that can sometimes make it harder to get a formal degree. Maybe it's harder to get your bachelor's degree. Maybe it's harder to get your graduate degree. Maybe it takes an extra year. Maybe it takes an extra two years. Maybe it takes your whole entire K2 Dasha. But whatever it will, or your K2 return, or whatever it might be, but you can expect certain challenges and obstacles as you change through your educational route until you find the one that's the best for you. Um, and this fifth house is also a house of spiritual techniques. And K2 is a very spiritual planet. So here we can learn about bhakti. We can learn about chanting. We can learn about Sanskrit. We can learn about certain spiritual rituals and techniques and all of these things. And it's aspected by the Rahu in the 11th house, which means we might have some friends from other cultures, from other traditions that want to introduce us to their cultures and traditions, and they have something to show us. They have some, something to give us. They have something to offer us. See, because the Rahu in 11th house position is very important for the K2 in the 5th house. Because even though some of your friends, maybe they party too hard and they will lead you into the wrong direction, but the right kind of Rahu friend is very spiritual, very mystical. They say focus on their spiritual, mystical lives, and they're there to open spiritual doors for you. And see, the fifth house, because it has spiritual techniques in K2, one thing that Dr. Dharmesh said, I agree, it is kind of hidden or it can act like it is hidden, which means it needs to be unlocked. It needs to come out. It wants to be unleashed. But what acts like the catalyst or the trigger for the unleashing of that spiritual power, for the unleashing of that spiritual memory? It might be an education from a friend from another culture. For example, I, was, I have uh, Saturn and Mula in the 11th house. When I was introduced to Jyotish when I was 11 years old, and I remember when I hear the word Jyotish, I said, Jyotish, what does that mean? And in my whole head, the whole day, all that was playing was the word Jyotish. Jyotish, Jyotish, Jyotish. So similarly, there's these friends that you will have in your life. They can have big impact on you to kind of act like a catalyst for your spiritual transformation. Um, now, as I get more into the K2 and the Leo sign, I have K2 in Porva Falguni, so it is in the Leo sign. And this is a strong position for, um, because of also double fire, just like K2 is fire and, and, and uh, Leo is fire. So you have double fire. So you have lots of fiery vibration, which is associated with this. The first nakshatra maga is K2 rule. So then you have double K2, double fire. 
So we can think about how, how intense that will be, especially if it's in a condition that's affecting your health negatively. But let's say this K2 in Leo is in a good position like a Kendra for, uh, in the first house, 10th house, 7th house, in a good position here. Um, it can actually very much push someone to go towards moksha, to push someone to reach their full potential, to push their potential to reach their destiny. And if there's one thing I can say from being a K2 Leo person and having Rahu in Aquarius, the Rahu in Aquarius side of you, it's willing to settle for what works because Aquarius is very pragmatic. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it works, it works, which means it can be kind of very hard to change because uh, things aren't bad. They're working out just fine. They, might, they could be better, but they're fine. So Aquarius says if it works, it works. But that K2 in Leo, it will not settle. It refuses to settle. It will constantly be pushing you to reach your full direction, to reach your full destiny. So even though in one life, one aspect of my life, things are okay, they work fine, I have no need to complain. Because of the K2 in Leo, it says, well, that's not good enough. You need to push to your full potential. You need to push to your full direction. Allow that sun's energy to come through the K2. Don't settle for anything. Don't settle in any areas of your life because settling will leave you with unhappiness. The only way for you to truly find happiness is to never settle and to constantly be seeking that highest potential. And that's some of what I like about the K2 in Leo. I hope that was interesting, Dr. Darmesh. And I look forward to the concluding uh, first part of our discussion here on the K2 in the sixth house and uh, Virgo positions. Yeah, so uh, by attaching the Ketu in the fifth house and Leo sign, there is a uh, double, as we know, the double transit. It's a double confirmation, we can say, and that we both have agree on the same thing that uh, is a karmic, karmic things. Fifth house and this. So moving ahead to the sixth house Ketu. Now, this is a one place or one position where the Ketu acts totally negatively. As I believe that the Rahu is great in the 6th house and Ketu is uh, very well set in the 12th house. But this is uh, just a reverse position that the Ketu is in the 6th house. What happened that the Ketu in the 6th house, the Rahu is uh, accelerate in the 12th house. So you are doing all the things which you should not supposed to do. You have incurred the loss, you are accelerating your bad habits, you are doing so many negative things. But even though knowing that things, you are not able to control the things. See what happened there is a, earlier all the houses we have described that the Ketu is a shadow. It doesn't allow to see what lies beyond this. What is, uh, it's not allowing you to open the curtains and to see what is uh, lies behind this scene. So this is the same thing happens. The Ketu in the sixth house means you are walking with your enemies, but you don't know that he is your enemy. You are walking, you are living with the disease, which may make you too much suffer, which make, may make so much fatal to your body, but you are not aware. Your body is a, have a producing so much toxics, so much poison, but you are not aware about it. You might have incurred so many debts. See, debt, only people think that the, whatever the money we owe from the others is only debt. No, that means whatever things you owe with the others. You have taken so many good things from others, but you are not giving them uh, in return. So that things also get to lies in the six out. They create so many deeds which uh, uh, from others, they have taken so many things from others but unable to return them in their present life. And that is because of this, the Ketu in the sixth house create the hidden enemy. When Rahu is in the sixth house, you can bravely say that he is my enemy. But when the Ketu is in sixth house, you are not able to realize, even though you know he is against you, but you have no option to leave him and you have to live with him. 
so this is a very critical position of a ketu in the sixth house is a house of disease we all know it's a house of uh, enemies is a house of uh, many bad things but ultimately the sixth house is a house of opposition the seventh house is house of opposite whereas seventh house uh, sixth house is a house of opposition what lies within you but you always oppose it that is a sixth house see we all know the immunity is also lies within our body as well as the deficit the deficit deficiency also lies in our body here the ketu is uh, uh, keeping your health on the um, uh, outer shed it will give you a very glossy picture that you are very fit but you are underestimating your own capacity you are underestimating or sometime it may say correctly that you are overestimating your own energy that you feel that whatever you will eat you will not suffer whatever you speak it will not suffer you but that is a wrong concept of a ketu in the sixth house and you are creating so many deeds you are absorbing so many good things from others but you are not giving back anything to them and that makes you a more beggars in the next life so whatever that things you have already accelerated in the past life being the rahu in the sixth house now that the pose has been kept by placing the ketu in the sixth house so by keeping the uh, putting the ketu in sixth house i believe that uh, even though knowing so many things as seen some doctors are ignorant or maybe many doctors might be in ignorance they give advice to all their clients but sometimes they forget to follow same for themselves and the heart doctor i seen the heart specialist doctor dies with the heart attack why that's a ketu in sixth house you don't know about your own things you feel that uh, you are uh, aware about the subject so you don't need anything into the taken care about yourself even if you are an astrologer you if you are ketu in sixth house means you are giving advice to so many people but you are forget to follow the same instruction for yourself and you are creating so many deeds now Uh, apart from the sixth house ketu if we discuss the ketu in the virgo sign as i told you that the virgo is a purely hard core sign of a mercury the soft sign of a mercury we have already seen in the logical sign of a, a gemini whereas in the virgo sign that's a very hard core uh, relation of a mercury attachment in the virgo that is why we call as a virgo as a mula trikon sign of a mercury own sign of a mercury and exalted sign of a mercury only a planet having three title in one sign that is a virgo you will not find any three title together with any planet except this mercury so mercury sign and very hard code sign of a mercury where the ketu is placed here the time is that that uh, even though you possess so much knowledge even you are very much a knowledgeable person you will not able to explore your knowledge to the world you will know all these things all the studies whatever you have done will not be able to utilize so this is a lacuna or you, we can say that this is a kalapurusha sixth sign and the sixth house we already discussed so even though you are intellectual even though you are uh, having a potential of creating something new your ideas are something different but you are sharing your ideas to the wrong people and they are exploring it in their own name and you will be uh, not able to get the benefit out of it so ketu having a very much potential in the virgo sign but the curse of that is that uh, you will not able to explore you will not able to enjoy the your own good thoughts but somebody will come and absorb your uh, ideas absorb your research see it's like a violation of ipr uh, as being a uh, legal background i am so it's a violation of your own patent all, uh, all your own research all your innovation novation your uh, copyright work will be uh, uh, copied by others and they will publish in their name and you will not able to do anything about it so that is a highly intellectual people having a ketu in the virgo sign but be careful 
before spreading all your knowledge you should be secure yourself but even though after keeping so many precaution people fall into the trap and they are not gain get benefit okay whatever the good things you have done not been paid in this life no worries in next life when rahu comes in the virgo you will be paid everything whatever you will be not paid in the your earlier life so nothing to worry but as such in this life all your intellectual level all your knowledge will be used by others you will be not given a credit and even though people or so many mass know that you are the creator but still you will not able to get a credit out of it so whether it is called a, a curse or whether it is called as a boon i don't know but somewhat the uh, it's a virgo sign ketu is not been considered good being having a logical mind you can't change your own perception and because of that confliction of this other people take a benefit of it and they will get success about it so that is all about the small uh, inputs about the ketu in the 6th house being a dry up your things and being ketu in the virgo sign which is also not being considered good for this but it is not given a debilitation being a friendly sign of a ketu it is not been given debilitation but i feel some that your intellectual level will not going to help yourself so that is my small inputs about this and uh, uh, i am eager to listen your part of uh, 6 house and the uh, virgo ketu and uh, uh, i'm uh, handing over this to you thank you your insights are wonderful dr darmesh and have a lot to do with my feelings and insights as well i mean i can't tell you how many 6th house k2 charts i've looked at who have surprise health challenges and so even though 6th house is upachai house i like the third position uh, of k2 much more than i like the 6th position of k2 cuz 6th position of k2 also puts rahu in 12 So I'd rather Rahu be in 6th house and K2 be in 12th. That's the natural positioning for that. So this is actually the opposite of the natural positioning for that. For for K2 and Rahu because K2 is signification 12. However, there is still an a positive energy of K2 in the 6th house of becoming a healer. But as Dr. Darmesh by mentioned, most people with K2 in the 6th house will not become healer of their own disease possibly they will become healer of other disease like the heart doctor who dies who dies from the heart attack and smoke the cigarette but there is still a, or um you know but uh the the dentist who has all of the cavities the the irony becomes more and more and more but the the k2 and the 6th out vibration it's uh the first three stages of disease which is the vikruti so k2 creates a lot of erratic unpredictable uh balance of the doshas within the body especially cuz k2 is a pitta planet you have to see what sign it's in to see what other dosha but pitta will be heavily fluctuating throughout the body and that can make the person very easily uncomfortable frustrated irritable they can deal with inflammation they can deal with skin issues um and as mentioned this is also a house of enemies and k2 can create some blindness and so it's important what you have in your 11th house when you have k2 in the 6th house so you can decipher who is truly my enemy and who is truly my friend and the thing about k2 in the 6th house it it's it's hard it's hard to know your enemy because not all enemies some enemies are hidden not 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 all enemies are like i'm here to get i'm i i'm here because i hate you and i'm out here to get to get at you no some enemies are just more selfish some enemies just care more about themselves and they don't really care about you So be careful in the 6th house especially with coworkers colleagues K2 in the 6th house that really the people that you work with that you team up with that you spend your time with that you're really allies they have your best interest in their heart they want you to be healthy they want you to be happy they want you to be successful but if you have K2 in the 6th house 
If the people you are spending your time with do not want you to be healthy, happy, and successful, then do not spend your time with those people because it will be contributing to your health negatively. Now, also the sixth house is an Arta house, but it separates from the 10th house Arta Baba because it's the work that we have to do to get us to where we need to go, which is called paying our dues. So oftentimes with people with K2 and 6th house, they have to work many jobs, many different jobs, and it's not the job that they want, and it's not the job that's their final destination, and it's their, not their job that their soul screams, yes, I'm so happy that this is the job that I am doing but they can still be very busy and making lots of money and very busy with work with K2 in the sixth house. But because it's not the work that they necessarily want to be doing, it might not be contributing positively to their health. So I always say when strong energies are in the sixth house, let's look at the 10th house. Let's look at your D10. Let's look at your higher career energies so that you can be more satisfied through the work that you're doing so that it won't impact your health in a negative way. And uh, so those are some of the things I wanted to mention about the sixth house position of K2. And because Rahu's aspecting it in the 12th, uh, this means that Rahu in the 12th, it has escapism tendencies. So because Rahu in the 12th has escapism tendencies, people with K2 in the sixth house, they might use drugs because drug is form of escape. And it's more for coming from the Rahu in the 12th house and the K2 relationship. They want to escape the reality because the responsibility of that sixth house K2 is so strong. So be very careful with addiction with K2 in the sixth house too. It doesn't mean you can't have one glass of wine at a wedding, but be very careful with the drug. And also with 12th house Rahu, there can be confusion on the path to moksha. And one of the things that we know is that taking drug does not bring you any closer to moksha. So don't make that confusion that any type of plant, even if it comes from God, it, will, it, will sh it might show you the work that what you can do to help bring you to moksha, but no plant on this earth will do the work for you. It is our soul much, which must do the work. So also consider that for sixth house position of K2. Now, when you look at K2 Virgo, it's not as difficult as K2 in Gemini. It's not considered debilitation or anything like that, but you're still having logic and intuition come together. So these people get very obsessive and, and they like to concentrate on things and they become very obsessed or concentrated on certain things. And it's like, you can call this living in your own little world or living in your own little tree house or living in your own little bubble. Maybe you have a game, maybe you have a hobby, maybe have you, you have an interest and all you want to do is everyone leave me alone and leave me alone with my interest. And because of Virgo, it's intellectual energies. So maybe the interest is academic, maybe the interest is books, maybe the interest is learning. I'm not saying that the interest is negative. I'm just saying that it kind of makes you want to focus on that interest and forget about everything else. And that's part of the uncomfortable version of the K2 in Virgo is it really wants to be able to focus on what it wants to focus on. And it doesn't want to be distracted from that. And, uh, but, but K2 in Virgo actually shows also very good for the study of scripture. They should, because of K2 and the spiritual signification, they should study scripture, they should study the Vedas, Bhagavad Gita, Yoga Sutras, Old Testament, New Testament, uh, Buddhism teachings, Taoism teachings, whatever kind of spiritual teachings there are, because this K2 in Virgo, it has a way of understanding those things in a way and communicating the lessons from those scriptures in a way that other people might be able to appreciate them especially if it's in a good position. So I just want to thank Dr. Dharmesh as we conclude the first part of our uh, K2 in all 12 signs and 12 houses. We've discussed K2 through the first six houses and through the first six signs and hope you will stay tuned for our second part.
Thank you so much, Dr. Dharmesh, for your input. Any concluding remarks which you'd like to share, sir? Definitely. Meeting soon. <laughs>